To my left, you'll see a grainy, kind of fuzzy photograph of something. Your job, I want you to tell me what you see. Take your best guess. Today's objective is to create a mathematical representation of a pattern. So what's going to happen is I'm going to give you some pattern of whatever, could be anything, and I want you to look at that and to create what's called a mathematical representation. And I'll show you what all those different representations are. And what we'll see is that we can use all of them to really, really describe patterns and relationships. Which brings us to this thing. Um, I hope when all of you looked at this, if your everything is functioning properly, that you probably saw a face. What kind of looks like a mask or maybe a robot or something like that. Uh, you can see eyes there, and then we kind of imagine another set of eyes there. This definitely looks like a nose. We can imagine nostrils there and there. And then we've got what feels like a mouth right there. And it's pretty easy to connect the dots and make a face out of this. Now, the reason that's significant is that this picture was taken in 1976 on the surface of Mars. That's no joke. This is really where that picture comes from. A probe called Viking was launched to orbit Mars and to take pictures of the surface. And this is one of the pictures that NASA sent back. Understandably, a lot of people, looking for a better way to say freaked out, but they freaked out because here is a seeming human face on the surface of Mars. Now it turns out that that's not actually what was going on here. It's a bunch of shadows that look like a human face. If we look at it from a different angle, and this is from data built on further missions, this is what it looks like from a different angle. It's just a mountain. There's nothing crazy about this. However, from this angle, with the shadows the way they are, it's very easy for us to see a face because our brains are programmed to look for patterns that look like faces. That helps us identify other people when we're looking around. Uh, so we're built... Does he need a mustache? I think he needs a mustache. Anyway, we're built to see faces. And so even in places where there aren't any, like the surface of Mars, we still see them if the right features occur. So what we want to do mathematically is we want to take that human brain's extraordinary ability to look at something where there's not a pattern and see one, well, we want to look at things where there is a pattern and see what that pattern is. And this is what mathematics is. Mathematics is the study of patterns and relationships. And we use numbers because they're extraordinarily powerful for describing uh, any kind of relationship. And so we take these situations from reality and we attach numbers to them, almost like our brain attached a face to that mountain range. And we can use these numbers to then study what the relationship is. So let's look at an example, and this extended example will last us the rest of the video while I show you all the different representations. So when you hear me say pattern, this is what I'm talking about. I've got a series here of three different what we call figures. So the first figure is this one all the way on the left, and then we change something about it, and it becomes this figure right here. And then we change something about that, and it becomes that figure right there. And so part of what we want to figure out <laughs> is what is changing as I move from this figure to this figure. Now, in order to help describe this mathematically, one of the things I'm going to do is to start attaching some numbers to this. Uh, because while math doesn't necessarily involve numbers, numbers make it easier. So the first thing we do to uh, establish some numbers on this is just to number the figures themselves. But we do so in a particular way. Notice that the first figure is labeled figure 0. Here's why. We want this number, so 0, 1, and 2, to represent the number of times the figure has changed. So with our starting one, figure 0, the figure hasn't changed at all yet. This is where it started. It changes once, and now that's figure one. When it's changed twice, now that is figure two. So that's the first level of number that we're going to attach to this. 
And the second one may seem like kind of an obvious one looking at it, but the second number we're going to look at is how many blocks there are. So in figure zero, there's one, two, three, four, five blocks. And be very systematic about the way you uh, count these. Notice I started all the way at the top left, and I counted down, then moved over and started from the top and counted down. Uh, it's easy to get lost, especially as we get into bigger figures, if you don't do that. Well, figure one, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight blocks. And in figure two, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And you may have noticed this from our pattern earlier, that what's happening is we're adding three blocks each time, which interestingly enough, lets us make a prediction about figure three, you know? So the first thing we're going to look at is how to represent this information. We said figure zero had five blocks, figure one had eight blocks, and figure two had 11 blocks. We're going to represent that as what's called an ordered pair. So in an ordered pair, you have two numbers that are related. Here, we're going to relate the figure number to the number of blocks, and we put them inside parentheses, separated by a comma. And in this case, when we're looking at patterns like this, we always want to put the figure number first. So figure zero has five blocks. So that right there is an ordered pair. And I can do the same thing for figure one. Figure one has eight blocks. Figure two has 11. And notice that each one of these is a self-contained pair contained by the parentheses. And interestingly enough, it actually doesn't matter which we put first. Now that being said, I still want you to put the figure number first, but as long as you're consistent, the mathematics will work out correctly. And as long as you communicate which number represents which. So as long as we can switch these if we want to, as long as we tell whoever's looking at our math, that the first number represents the number of blocks and the second number represents the figure number. Now when I have three ordered pairs like this that are all together, these all describe this one situation. In order to show that these ordered pairs are together, I put a pair of curly brackets around them to show that these ordered pairs all belong together. And this is now called a set of ordered pairs. So this is our first way of communicating the information in this figure. Again, the first number tells us the figure number, the second number tells us how many blocks there are. We can also do this with something called a table. So in a table, we're going to write the two related numbers side by side, separated by this vertical line. And it's still the same information. Figure 0 had 5, figure 1 had 8, and figure 2 had 11. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put the figure numbers on the left side. And that's when we're doing these patterns. I want you to have the figure number on the left side. But we're going to label what that is. So on top, I'm going to write figure number so that I know that's what this column represents. So in figure number 0, over here, I'm going to write that this is the number of blocks. And so in figure 0, there are five blocks, and the numbers that are side by side are related to each other. So we know that figure 0 has five blocks. Figure 1 then would have eight blocks, and figure 2 would have 11. And we can see this is the same exact information as in our ordered pairs. There is no difference there other than how it's written. Also, I cannot stress enough how important it is to label what each column means up top so that anybody who's uh, reading this will know what we're talking about. Math is a language. Languages are built to communicate. So we have ordered pairs. We have tables. The next thing we're going to look at is something called a mapping. And a mapping is actually very similar to a table, except instead of having that T, where we write things in columns on each side, we're going to have two ovals, and we write the values inside the oval. So again, we're dealing with the exact same information here. Figure 0 has 5, figure 1 has 8, figure 2 has 11. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the figure numbers 
over here. 0, 1, and 2. And I'm going to write over top of this that this is a figure number. And then over here, I'm going to write the number of blocks. So I label it. That's incredibly important. Again, we're communicating here. Make sure you communicate what this is. The number of blocks, and it could be 5 or 8 or 11. And so what I do now is I connect each figure number with its number of blocks using an arrow. So figure 0 had 5 blocks. Figure 1 had 8 blocks. And figure 2 had 11 blocks. Now interestingly enough in a mapping we don't have to have everything lined up. Like it's okay if an arrow crosses through here. Um, and also we don't ever have to repeat values because we can just use the same number and draw multiple arrows from it. Which is pretty nice. And I want you to notice that, again, this communicates the exact same information as our ordered pair and our table. It's just now in a different form. We can also do this in what's called a sequence. And this one is probably the trickiest of the ones that we'll look at today. Figure 0 has 5 again. Figure 1 has 8. Figure 2 has 11. So in a sequence, what you're going to do is you're just going to write the values down in the order they appear, separated by either commas or spaces. But here's where it gets different. Sequences always start from the first changed figure. You never start from figure one, or figure zero rather, but you start with figure one. So this sequence would start out as eight, 11, and then we're kind of out. That would be it here, except we know what figure three would be. We're adding three each time. So the next number in the sequence would be 14. And then the number after that would be 17. And really, we can continue this as long as we want to. I'm going to stop here. But I want you to notice that for a sequence, when I'm writing out these values, that I'm starting with the first changed figure, figure 1. Now, the way it works in all the other representations, we have two numbers. We have 0 and 5 go together. 1 and 8 go together. 2 and 11 go together. Same thing here. Same thing here. With a sequence, we don't write out this figure number because it's implied by the position of the number. So number 8 goes first, so it, that's implying that figure 1 has 8. Number 11 goes second, so figure 2 has 11. Number 14 goes third, so number three has, or figure 3 has 14, so on and so forth. But I don't actually write those numbers down. So again, a sequence, probably the trickiest one out of the ones we'll talk about here. And our final one that we're going to look at is what's called a graph. So in a graph, we have one set of our numbers, uh, we'll say our figure numbers in this case, represented on a horizontal axis. So this one right here. And just like everything else, we want to label it. So this horizontal one will be our figure number. That tells us what's going on there. And then our other one is uh, what's going on on this vertical line is our number of blocks. And so again, figure 0 is 5, figure 1 is 8, figure 2 is 11. And so we'll label this, what's called axis, this vertical number line, as the number of blocks. And so now what I do is this. I say figure number 0, so I go to 0 on the horizontal axis has five blocks. So I put a dot there. Figure number one has eight blocks. And so that point tells me that the figure number is one and the number of blocks is eight. Figure number two has 11 blocks. Now what you'll not see me do right here is draw a line through these. Each one of these represents a distinct point there's nothing to suggest we would connect these points yet, so we're not going to. We just leave them as points on a graph. We'll get to the point where we connect them later. So to recap, math is really just the study of patterns and relationships. We're going to look at these visual patterns where we have figures, starting with figure 0, where the number tells us how many times it's changed, and we're going to apply numbers to that to explore the relationship between the figure number and the number of individual elements in that. So again, 
a number of the figures, starting with figure 0, figure 1, figure 2, and then I count how many individual elements there are in that and use that as my other set of numbers. And then I can use all these different representations to describe those relationships, and that includes ordered pairs, tables, mapping, sequences, and graphs. And remember, we're communicating. We always want to tell our reader what each one means.